Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Zach on Sports. I'm your host, Zach Gershman. With me today is one of the greatest sports figures, one of the greatest voices in all of sports, CBS and Westwood One's own Kevin Harlan. Welcome, Kevin, to Zach on Sports. Uh, Zach, good to be on with you. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, I sure have looked forward to this. I'm always, always interested in talking to bright young broadcasters in the business, and you certainly fit that bill. You're off to a great start. I appreciate that. More than words can express. I really do. But, Kevin, we are living in a world that is now the new normal. As a broadcaster, having broadcasted games in some of these jam-packed arenas, I've heard you said in an interview as a Philadelphia sports fan, which I seem to bring up a lot in these Zach on Sports interviews, but you broadcasted the Toronto Raptors versus Philadelphia 76ers Game 7 NBA playoff game, and you said that The crowd is like an orchestra. And as a broadcaster, sometimes you just have to let the symphony kick in. You have to let it take over. Have you given any thought to what it could be like broadcasting games without fans or even broadcasting them through a monitor? Well, that's a great question. We've uh, um, talked about it briefly with Turner and CBS, but I don't think anything yet has been has been put together. I would tell you that when I do the NBA 2K video game, uh, there is not uh, a lot of crowd noise in our headsets when we're watching clips, but there is some. And it does certainly help modulate, guide, give you a sense of where your tenor, uh, where your tone, where your volume should be. It's nothing like being in a jam-packed arena to let that crowd serve as a building force in back of your call. But I would say that um, under the circumstances, Zach, there will be ways to make it sound for the broadcaster as lifelike as possible. And I think for the viewer, too, I think the viewer, while enjoying the comments on the court and on the field and some things we'll be able to hear cadence and some smack back and forth among and between the players. I think we need ambient noise. So I know that they are working, Zach, in a diligent way to figure out how that's going to be done. Not as hard as you, as you would think. Um, it's just how much, to what degree, and who controls that crowd volume. But I think there will be some of it will be when we're doing these games from our homes or from a studio, not in the arena, not at the stadium, if that is the course they choose. Uh, I, I, th- I think we'll have as good a situation as you could hope for under the circumstances. I don't know if you looked at my notes ahead of time, but my next question was actually about the NBA 2K series. You became the voice of the 2K series. You've been the voice for the last 10 plus years. What was it like when you, how, how was it when they approached you and they said, we want you to be the voice of the new 2K series? Well, you know, I hadn't given it much thought. Uh, we have a son who had not been playing video games. He's the baby of our four kids. Our girls didn't play. We had three, we have three girls and our, our son. And he was just a little guy at the time. So he really wasn't the video games. So I knew very little about it. So 2005, I believe, was my first year. And um, I thought, you know, well, you know, why not? It's, it's, uh, it's a little bit of off-season work. Actually, when I first got it, here's what I was thinking. I was thinking, I'm looking for a way in the off-season to keep my voice strong. I'm looking for a way to kind of practice a little bit, keeping my vocal cords tuned um, to a game level. I thought, this will be a perfect way to do it. Call a couple hours a day, um, use my voice, which I normally wouldn't do from the middle of May to the beginning of August when I start preseason football. So I thought of it in those terms. Then I had a producer at CBS tell me as the game was continuing to develop in 05, 06, 07, and getting bigger and more sophisticated, he said, you know what you're doing? He said, all these kids in this country overseas are playing this game and they hear your voice every single night 
associated with the NBA. He said, you're going to build a nice following for your call of the NBA and recognized kind of in those terms. I never thought of it that way. He said, you're investing in your career. So I said, well, that's great. Now I'm doing two things. I'm keeping my voice, you know, in shape during the off season. I'm building this, this nice little uh, following, if you will. And, and then as it has continued to grow, Zach, it's, it's been uh, very, um, uh, very gratifying to hear moms and dads and kids when I go to arenas and go to stadiums say, hey, I, I hear your voice every night uh, from down in our basement when my son or daughter's playing the game. So that's been a lot of fun. I'm, I was one of those kids. It's always mom, mom. I, I, one more game, please. I just need one more game. You said, that, you said, though, that it's like a fantasy. It's every play-by-play broadcaster's fantasy to broadcast these NBA 2K games. I know you said that your son didn't really play video games, but did you feel like a kid again when you're broadcasting and seeing these graphics on the screen? You know, I, I've got to be honest with you. I've never played the game. I've watched really? my son play. No. I've watched my son play, but he usually plays with the volume down. <laughs> I don't think he wants to hear any more of dad's voice than he has to. Uh, of course, now he's out of college, but, but um, he'll call sometimes and if, when he was in school and college, and I'll hear them playing it in the background and hear my voice. And, um, um, you know, I, I, uh, it, the way they give it to us, Zach, the way that we record it, is so lifelike um, that it looks just like a regular broadcast. Yes. So, and the graphics get better every year. Yes, yes. And I'm actually calling live action that they then take and put in games or cut it up and put parts of the call in different segments of the animated game. So I'm really, um, uh, you know, I don't see the bells and whistles and all the things that they put into it. Um, but have seen it when I've gone like to the NBA experience at, at all-star games and they'll have me walk around and, and say hello to some of the fans, uh, the league will, not the, not the 2K folks, but I'll see a section over there where the 2K uh, game is set up and they put it on the loudspeaker and big video boards and kids are playing it and I can hear my call. So I'm, I'm just amazed at what they do. Um, and how they do it. They're so smart and so gifted. Um, I'm just, I'm so happy to be a part of the game. We're recording right now for mm -hmm. 2K21. Uh, and um, I, I, I just know how many people have got their input, their technical know-how, their imagination into the game and it's it's very gratifying to be a part of, of something so big i'm a small part but to be a part of something so big in a time like this where there aren't any, any live sports you know sometimes you got to resort to video games sometimes you got to resort to the graphics but it, kevin it, it doesn't look it looks realistic I'm, it does, I'm stunned it does. At how far the game has progressed i've done it what 15 16 years i'm stunned at how if i were just passing and as I've done at All-Star Weekend and gone through the experience in these big um, arenas and big uh, 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 places of gathering, um, it, looks like a, it looks like live TV. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. shocked at how, how realistic it is. In 2017 and in 2019, you were voted Sportscaster of the Year by your peers in the broadcasting field. Where were you when you found out the news and how special was it knowing that your peers voted you in for the award and then to win it again two years later? Well, um, very humbling as, as this business is in so many ways, but uh, to know that the people that do what you do voted you such a prestigious award and then thinking, Zach, of all the great broadcasters that have won it before me, Nance and Buck and um, uh, Lindsey Nelson and, and uh, Jim Simpson and, and uh, Ray Scott and Pat Summerall and Al Michaels and Doc Emmerich, who I, he's made my hero for a long time. I, I, um, I, I'm, it's really, I, I was speechless, but I got a call the first time a couple years ago when I was home between games 
and Dave Gorn, who runs the the uh, organization, called and and had said, uh, "Well, I'm calling to inform you that you've just been elected, voted by your peers as the sportscaster of the year." And I was speechless and uh, emotional, and um, and then after it sank in, just so incredibly humbled when I myself vote like all the members do, and had voted. I I, I think I've I've either voted for Tariqa or Emmerich the last handful of years that I've, you know, been voting. And so to know that, that people that are doing what I do thought that is, there is no higher honor. Um, mm -hmm. Awards that are voted outside of this, like Emmy Awards, are voted on by people that don't broadcast for the most part. Um, they're producers and directors and their viewpoint is so different. But to get voted on by the people that do what you do, um, there is no higher honor in this business. And so I, I am uh, humbled beyond words and, and so grateful. And I guess what could, contribute, what could contribute to that is after all of your games, you go back and you listen, and you critique all your broadcasts, you re-listen to it. Your daughter, Olivia, was on Zach on Sports a couple of weeks ago. And she oh, said- she that, really? <laughs> yes, she was. And she said that you, she admires all the work you do, but she admires so much how you follow the rule of 10,000 hours and how you need to follow the 10,000 hours to truly master, master doing something and repetition is always necessary. Talk about what role the 10,000 hours has played in your success. Well, I think in broadcasting, 10,000 hours is probably just a starting point. Uh, I've probably put in maybe 20 or 30,000 hours, and I am still learning to this day. In fact, right before our call, I was going over my uh, games from last year because the NFL is going to start at the same time the NBA restarts, mm -hmm. and the seasons are going to run concurrently. Usually, I can begin with the NFL, spend my summer going over each weekend of my calls from the previous years, take my notes, make my, my suggestions on how to get better, but now I'm going to have to go back because I've been off for so long with basketball as I've done the last month or so, go back and listen to my NBA and college basketball games and get back in that mode. So uh, in the morning, I'm doing one sport in the evening, I'm doing the other. And it is not, it is not a, a fun process at all. In fact, it's, it's torturous <laughs> to go back and listen because I could have, you know, said in any given situation, uh, the description of a play or a word or whatever, a hundred different ways, a thousand different ways. So I, I think that's the challenge for all broadcasters is to continually evolve. And the moment that you don't evolve, uh, you know, you've probably hit the end of the road. It, it's got to be enticing. It's got to be fulfilling. It, there has got to be something that drives you more than than just doing the game and putting down the headset and waiting a week or waiting three or four days when you pick it up again there's got to be some in between every skill person in this any performance person in the world always practices always goes back and uh, whether they look uh, extensively or just a snippet of what they had done the night before in a performance they all probably go back and watch some of it and certainly practice between those engagements. And I don't know how you can, I, for me, because I'm not, I'm not talented to the point where I can just rest on my laurels and just, you know, fall into a broadcast. I couldn't do that. I'm not talking about game preparation, which we all do. I'm talking about the art of voice and projection and words and speed and rhythm and pacing and tone and tenor and all the things that make broadcasting a, an art, a, a skill. And, and I am learning every time I, I put on a tape and get my notebook out and begin to take notes, I write something different um, about a, a play in a situation, how I wish I'd handled it differently, or just, just in the same vein, I, I like the way that I called that. I'm glad that I let the moment breathe I'm, I'm i'm happy with my um uh, referencing the graphic on the screen uh when i listen to my radio stuff 
um, um, talk slower, have it mean more. Um, I mean, just, just all kinds of things that would only resonate in my mind. You may listen to one of your games and, and do it differently. And, and that's okay. There's no right or wrong way to do it. There's only your way. And you've got to perfect your way as much as you can in a very imperfect business. So I, I know it is a part of my prep almost to the degree that it's more important that I do that than have all these 18 notes per player. Um, it's the call that matters. No one ever will, will criticize me or any broadcaster by saying, hey, you never mentioned that his mom, you know, baked bread every day of his life or, or that he had, uh, you know, uh, a leg that was two inches shorter and they added, you know, two inches to his cleats. Or How something. could you? How could and, you and, and so you never get, you, that never comes up. But what does come up is the call, your call of a touchdown, your call of a, of a, of a fourth and one, your, 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 your call of a game winning three point shot. You know, that, that always comes up. So I have focused on, on presentation. I have focused on performance. And, and when you get into that, now you're talking about, a myriad and many layers of what it takes to be a good broadcaster. And I am far from perfect. So I like the challenge and the evolution of always being better. So when we say 10,000 hours, to me, 10,000 hours is a starting point. Mm -hmm. You've got to have at least 10,000 hours before you even become somewhat proficient and then spend the rest of your career chasing proficiency which is tough to do we're, we have a segment here on zach on sports called beyond the mic where we get to know kevin harlan the person we know kevin harlan the broadcaster the preparation side of kevin harlan but we want to know kevin harlan the person you ready for it uh, okay <laughs> so you already said that before this call you were recapping you were re-watching some of your games continuing to work on your craft but what does kevin harlan do as a leisure activity? What does he do for fun during a downtime? Well, um, spend time with my wife, who is the single most important, important person um, in my life. Um, and we, we have our four kids. We have one grandchild and one uh, granddaughter on the way. Um, we have new son-in-laws. Um, and, and I have found that once you take your eye off the ball, and for me, that means wife, family, and each one of those kids' lives. Once you take your eye off that, start looking at where can I get this speaking engagement? Where can I add to my schedule? Or where can I, you know, go out and, and, and do something else that is not family-oriented? Is, is that, that's a problem, I think. Um, so, so I probably don't have as many friends or friend activities that I once did. We, if we do activities, usually with couples or certainly with our kids and their uh, spouses. So the, the, in the wake of making that a priority, I don't have the free time to go uh, golf as much, if at all, unless I'm doing it with my wife or our, our family. Um, spending time with my buddies, um, hobbies, whether it be, uh, you know, working on our, our antique fishing boat or any of that kind of stuff. I, it, it, there's just no room in that, uh, in my schedule for that. So I've chosen that path and feel it's very um, fulfilling. I, I, I find great fulfillment and personal satisfaction in and maybe missing some guys' weekends, golfing, um, whatever, uh, to stay at home when I'm at home because I'm gone so much. My wife now travels with me as much as possible. We see our kids a lot. One of the great things that I've had our girls say to me over the years is that they never really ever remember a time when they had something important, a birthday, graduation, prom, um, being crowned a, a, a homecoming queen, whatever it might have been, um, they never remember me not being there. 
And certainly there were times when a birthday was maybe on a Monday and we celebrated on Tuesday when I got back to town or that I couldn't go to church with them on Sunday because I was doing a game. Um, but they, they can honestly say uh, to a child, and we have got the four, that they never remember me not being there. And to me, that was as, as uh, wonderful as them saying, hey, dad, I love you. You know, I just, I just feel like, like you've got to, you, you can't do everything. You can't be everything to everybody. And I apologize to my friends. Hey, I can't go on that golf weekend. I can't be a part of that poker or that book club or the, or the what, because I'm, I'm, I'm at home. When I'm home, I'm home. I, I, and, and, but I have no regrets either. Um, some have tried to do it all, and uh, you probably end up not doing it well. I'd rather concentrate on when I'm home, being home. And um, I, I've, always, I've always compared it to being when you're on the road and gone for a couple of days and come back. You know, the, 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 the uh, Ferris wheel, um, it continues to go without, at the same speed, and it's up to you to jump on and, and catch up with everybody. So, you know, what's helped are have been Zoom calls with the kids who don't live here, um, have been uh, many calls and texts over the time that I'm gone. So, so uh, modern innovation and, and, and those type of things have been wonderfully helpful. I don't know how dads in the 30s, 40s who had to travel a lot got it done because now you can text and get a quick reply from, a, from our three girls or our son or, or my wife instantaneously. So, so um, that's, that's kind of me away. I don't watch a lot of sports when I'm home. Really? I'm in the background. No, I don't. I, I, wow. I uh, to be honest, when my time ends with Turner in the playoffs, because I want it to end after the second round, I do not want to go any further. I, I, in my contract, it is stipulated that I I'm done after the second round by design uh, so I can start my summer because my my work period begins August 1st with NFL preseason. And by the way, during the summer, I'm working two, three hours a day all summer long doing the video games. So I really don't have like a time when I'm just completely off. But when I am, I am home. And, uh, and that means we're watching movies or we're walking or we're on the boat or we're making a meal together or we're visiting with our kids or, and their spouses or, or doing whatever. But I, I rarely say, oh, I've got to watch game seven tonight of the finals. I mean, I may have it on in the background. I may glance at it. Uh, I may watch a baseball game here or there in passing, but I never will watch the full game. I never make an appointment TV. When I'm done, I'm finished. That, that, that's it. I, I've got other interests in other parts of my life. Speaking of being finished, I see the Kansas Jayhawks basketball behind you. What advice, there it is, what advice would you, would you give yourself right now, would you give to 22-year-old Kevin leaving the University of Kansas, what advice would you give yourself? Um, well, number one, I would not change anything in my life or career. I, I would not change one thing, how my career has uh, unfolded, uh, how my life with my family and I've been married 33 years, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. Um, love the school I went to, love the high school I went to, love, uh, the cities I've lived in, which has basically been Kansas city. Um, I, I would not change anything. The, the only thing, um, that I might say that I think I've developed over the years and my message to young broadcasters like you, Zach, is that um, the basics we, we all hear, like my dad told me when growing up, he said, there's nothing like waking up every morning and, and looking forward to your day and looking forward to your profession. Um, he said, I, it, it's almost like a hobby when I wake up and he was in professional football for 37 years. He was in major league baseball for five, before that, and he was major college athletics for three or four. So I, I've always remembered that. And so I knew that when I was growing up. So I wouldn't have told myself that. Um, I, of course, growing up, 15-year-old me, I would have known nothing about 
social media, cell phones, computers, because when I was 15, it was what, 1976 or 1977. So I, I, I wouldn't have known anything about that. Um, I, I, guess, I guess the one thing that I have learned as I've looked back and have watched my own life develop and career develop and watching that of my kids is that really it, it's not the destination which is the most satisfying part of your career. Um, it's, it's the things that happen along the way. So in, in, in uh, the phrase we all hear, it's not, you know, the, 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 the journey is the reward, right? So I guess I would have told myself that, um, or, or listen more, that, that enjoy all the mistakes you've made along the way, because that will only be something now you cross off the list and you're going to be better at next time. And, and you know, develop at your own pace. I think I probably pushed myself very hard. Um, one thing I was very happy that I did, of course, you never know when you're going to meet that special someone in your life, is I'm glad I didn't meet my wife until I was about 26. Um, because I could be really selfish with my time from college through graduation in my early 20s and really work on being um, who I was going to be as a pro. So my life, if you looked at in a, in a scale, my life was heavily balanced at that time toward me selfishly, working countless hours, uh, taking on probably more than I should have handled, learning along the way, never saying no to every opportunity. But then as my wife, Anne, came into my life, you know, things had to do this because that's only fair to the relationship. And then it evened out. But I was glad that I was selfish. And so I'll tell college kids, I say, you know, you can only be 20, 21, 22, one time in your life. And be selfish with your career. Get it off the ground make the mistakes and do the grunt work and get that out of the way. And at the same time, prepare yourself for that person, whoever he or she is, when they come into your life, you are, are ready, but that you've done like a lot of the heavy lifting and a lot of the grunt parts of this business, maybe at an earlier time, you were so selfish, but you should be because you've worked hard to get a degree and if you quickly jump into a relationship and have a family, you know, it's not fair to that relationship and that family to, to try to be as committed to your job. So if, if at all possible, in a perfect world, you know that whoever that special someone is out there is, is waiting and you're always constantly preparing yourself, you know, emotionally for that, personally for that. But until then, just keep working your, your behind off in, 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 in trying to make every broadcast and every thing that you do in this business uh, worthwhile and impactful so that you kind of get through those stages and you can then give the, the, the amount of time that the, the, the most important part of your life will be, and that is you know, if it is for that person, it's, it varies person to person. For me, it was important mm -hmm. um, and can't think of my life and the, the, the uh, successes that I've been able to, uh, by the grace of God, accomplish. I can't even imagine where my life would be without that part of my life. So that, that's just my, that's just personally. Um, so when I'm talking to college kids, they say, be selfish with your career. Pour every moment you've got into it. And it may mean, you know, not going out on Friday night with your buddies because you've got to edit tape or you've got to watch tape or you've got to get your boards ready for that Saturday broadcast. And, and um, but that's what it is. I always told my daughter, Olivia, I said, I'll know how dedicated you are about this business by hearing what your college weekends are like. And I got to see it when she was in high school here in Kansas City and saw that she was unbelievably dedicated. But we all know when you go to college, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that can 
seduce you the other way, parties and buddies going on road trips or going to this or being there or doing, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can tear you away from, from, you know, making the main thing, the main thing, because mm -hmm. the main thing always is the main thing. It never doesn't become yes. the main thing. Right. So I, and then she told me, I, I cannot tell you how many times she was at Georgia. And I told her, I said, Liv, you cannot be in it part time. You just can't. It, the business, it's not fair to the business. It's not fair to you. If you're going to be what you want to be, there have got to be sacrifices. Every mm -hmm. great athlete has made those sacrifices. Every person has got to make those sacrifices. So listen to her schedule. I knew Zach, she was making those she was making those sacrifices and it's paid off for her. It's paid off. Of course, for her. It's, it's all about, it's all about being a go-getter. Sometimes you got to give up, but the reward at the end is even greater. So Kevin, we're wrapping up the episode here. We're going to go into a quick rapid fire round. Three quick questions here, kind of a this or that, but I want to get the first thing that comes okay. to your mind. Right. So what's the best March madness game you've called? Wow. I mean, I've done it. I've done 25 years of them. 22 with CBS. Um, that's smart. You know, you would normally think it would be a buzzer beating shot. And we've, I've had my sh fair share of those. Um, I would say Zach, that there was this kid from Weber state. It was my, it was actually my first NCAA tournament with CBS and there was a kid for Weber State you know which at that time uh, was such a you know small unknown school but there's this kid named Harold Arsenault and they were playing we were in Seattle I was doing it with John Sunvold and they were playing North Carolina and Dean Smith was away from the program and um, um, they were, they were like a four or three seed and they were playing Weber state, which was what, like a 13 seed or 14 seed. And um, this kid had like 38 or 39 points. And, you know, it was my first CBS tournament. I, I, I had done two, two years, with, three years with the university of Missouri, four years uh, um, with college ball, the other years with Kansas. So, but now I was doing it nationally for CBS. And the kid had like 38, 39 points and became an overnight sensation. So that kid's performance. And then Ari Farouk Manesh with Northern Iowa, when Northern Iowa, a nine seed, beat Kansas, a number one overall seed uh, in Oklahoma City with, I think, you know, multiple three-point shots, including one late in the game. So probably Ari Farouk Manesh, who was like 5'10", you know, built like Barney Rubble, little guy who went and hit and was fearless and shot these threes and shot down the number one overall seed. They went to the Sweet 16 because of his hot hand. So I'd probably say Ari Farouk Manesh, that was in 08 or 09, and then Harold Arsenault with Weber State um, back in 99, and then Eric Maynor with, with VCU who beat Duke on a buzzer beating floater inside the lane in Buffalo. Uh, again, Duke was Duke and VCU was VCU. And it was a big time shot that knocked off a giant. Wow. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the Mike Tyson versus Buster Mathis Jr. fight? The week before I had called Al Michaels and Cost uh, Al Michaels and who else did I call? Jim Lampley and called those guys and asked them for the terminology. I had not done boxing. <laughs> I had not done, but Fox wanted me to. And so I remember talking to Michaels who had done a lot of it and Lampley who's made a career of it and asked them about, you know, when a guy punches a guy like this, what's that called? And when a guy, you know, does, uh, you know, what, you know, I wanted to make sure I had the vernacular down and, and, um, and just, and, and both had said, rely on your analysts. And I had two analysts for that and how important it was for Fox. If you remember, it was supposed to be, it was a delayed fight because somebody was injured. I don't know if, if Buster was or Tyson, one of the two was injured. So it was supposed to be like in late summer's fall and they moved it to like December in Philly. 
And so I wasn't originally supposed to do it in the summer or early fall. I, I don't know who was supposed to do it. I'm, I'm guessing it was Pat Summer. But for whatever reason, they chose not to have him do it in December, maybe schedule on the Sunday game he had the next day. So, um, but that's what I remember, calling these giants in boxing broadcasting, asking them what they did and, uh, and just going through it and loved the energy of boxing and it was a lot of fun. And finally, which of these Kevin Harlan calls is your favorite? You could give a third option if you want. Two games at once or the cat running on the field or a third option. Which one is your favorite call? Uh, I, I would definitely, definitely say uh, the two games at once because it was in the body of a broadcast as, mm -hmm. as uh, reporting events were going on. And um, the cat was like a sideshow circus, but part of the broadcast. And, and that was fun. And I'm glad people took it that way. Um, and totally organic, as was calling the two games at once, week 17 of the NFL season, when the Chiefs were hoping the Patriots would lose at home to Miami, and the Kansas City win coupled with the New England loss would be, would be, um, would be uh, you know, a difference of a bye week or not a bye week. So calling those at the same time was a lot of fun, but within the body of the broadcast with football centric stuff and so clearly again all happening organically clearly that was my favorite incredible call incredible interview kevin harlan thank you so much for coming on zach on sports i greatly appreciate it had a fantastic time hope you did as well thank you zach great to be on with you and i'm going to follow your career with great interest you're uh, you're kind to uh, to invite me to your program thanks thanks again very much best words I've heard all day. Everybody else, I'll see you guys next time on Zach on Sports.